just give us a quick introduction to yourself, Katerina? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for, for, for choosing me. I guess it's a great honour. I'm, I'm part of the Global Partnerships team at Liverpool Football Club. So, um, yeah, a great, a great time for the club, a great time to join them and a great day for us today finally lifting that trophy. I was going to say, I do have to pass my congratulations on to the club. Obviously, great news for the men, maybe not such good news for the women. I know, it's quite, it's quite a contrast, but I think, the, the, I think the message at the moment in the current climate is that this is an incredible win for the club, the city, just the community, and hopefully empowering everyone on this journey. Yes, absolutely. And, and as long as you can embrace both, both the clubs, both the men's and women's game at the same time, I think that's a great step forward. Yeah. So, so I'm going to take you back first of all, and, and I'd like you to share with me a little bit about your career to date and your journey to Liverpool. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, well, so my career started in television distribution. Um, and then I kind of did a for a good 11 or so years with a leading news um, channel. And I sort of started in an ad sales role, but then over the years sort of progressed into more commercial strategic roles. And, and that's when I kind of started to get some international exposure to global markets, global brands. But then I was also being able to attend some really high profile sports events. And that's where I was seeing the behind the scenes. So the business around these sports and and I was just so fascinated by it, you know, and, and just inspired. I mean, I, I am a sports fan, so I have to sort of say that I've always have had an interest, but just the business was something that I just, I just wanted to be a part of it. So I then kind of took a bit of a pause, um, detox from the, the media world, because I wanted to, I wanted to find the right role and the time to find the right steps in transitioning into the sector and also figure out how can I fit um i'll be quite honest to say that it took a bit longer than i thought um it was there were some really challenging moments but that time meant that i could really learn and follow up you know on the industry trends build a network i was very active on linkedin i it's a phenomenal platform i was just looking at who are the people in the sports that i'm interested in i was bold in sort of asking for informal calls, informal kind of meetings, and just really looking to build that network and build my knowledge. And, and I guess that sort of, I guess, determination and the time to network and learn, I would say, really stress the learning, um, got, me to, got me to the position of Liverpool because, it, you know, last year they were, they were quite, um, uh, they took a risk, I would say, in that they were looking to recruit people outside of sport and outside of football. So that's the, the journey to date. So that was the great match between what you could bring to the party and what they could bring to the party. They wanted something new, you wanted to move into sports. So sounds like sounds like the perfect, perfect match there. And, yeah, and the timing. And did you find any, you know, did you, uh, so was this a role that was advertised or did you actually find the role through LinkedIn and through your connections? So interestingly with, with Liverpool, um, the first time around I was interviewed, there was actually another opportunity sort of simultaneously happening. And the other opportunity was actually a role that ultimately got created as a result of the networking. But again, uh, you know, these cliches that people say about timing and it's true because it, that didn't quite work out the way it was expected. And then when Liverpool came back to the table through a recruiter, but through LinkedIn actually, so they were being proactive, it was a bit of a, there's no way I can miss this opportunity you know this is the best time to join a football club and if ever just going to join a football club it's the best club to join so yeah fantastic very good so so what would be um what would you be your advice to young women looking to move into the sports industry then so give give us some of your tips um I think my advice I think it's also advice I would give just, you know in general if you're starting your career or if you're at that point in your career where there's a bit of a you know is there a shift that you, you want to make I would say be very focused be very detailed in uh, what you want to do you have to be clear but I think equally be open to opportunities that you might not have thought you could get there through that avenue um, I would say what else would I be be honest be driven um, be ready for some very very challenging experiences but equally some very you know positive moments as well and but i think you know you need to know what is your end goal 
um, you know, and without sounding cheesy, if you don't believe in your value and your skill set, then no one else will. So be clear on what it is you want to get across in these interviews or, you know, I said I was quite proactive with LinkedIn. If you're sort of trying to instigate these discussions, you know, what are you trying to get out of these conversations? You know, I mean, I was saying the example about reaching out for coffees, yeah. you know, I wasn't just going for a chit chat, you know, I, I had a strategy, I had a plan, I wanted, you know, you're getting that time with someone senior in a sector you're trying to get in. So, you know, you need to make sure you're getting some follow up, but equally it's essential, I think, to know what your value is in those conversations and how do you want them to remember you? And then equally how, when you start a career. Can I ask about how you actually approach people and, and what was it that made them say, sure, I'll have a cup of coffee with you? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I will say that it's like, you know, with the old days of sending a CV, you send out 50 and you might get three back and there'll be three no's. But um, it, was, it, was, it was literally a hi, sort of, can I, do you have 15 minutes for a quick coffee or maybe a call? I'd love to hear more about your sector, sort of starting with that. Then as I was starting to get a bit more confident in, in actually which way I wanted to go, it was a bit more tailored sort of, then I you know, did the premium subscription. So then, <laughs> could, so then you could use more characters. Um, and then it was tailoring more though the actual, you know, being a bit clever with it. You know what, this is my background. This is what I've got. These are my skills. This is the value I see in coming into the sector. Um, yeah, and the challenges were that sometimes you were meeting with people who did just have a sports experience and didn't quite see that transition. And, and that's why I was very honest to say there were challenging moments. But like you said, it, it got to the point of the stepping stones to get to Liverpool to recognise actually that's a skill set that we do need to further this club. Yeah, absolutely. And I must ask a little bit about the culture in, in, in Liverpool Football Club and, and in the department you're in. You know, how do you find it? Is it a woman in a man's world? It's so it's, so it's interesting for me because I I'm grew up with a lot of male cousins. So I'm, I'm actually very used to being surrounded by a lot of strong men, uh, but also equally very strong women in the family. So I'm, I kind of just like being around sort of everyone. I think what's interesting about Liverpool is there's an interesting mix. I'm one of three new female hires actually. Um, but there's a, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not sort of, you know, sort of 90, 98%. There's a good balance that they're working through and I think they're quite conscious of that. So what do you think, uh, what are the particular challenges that we need to overcome to make the sports industry a more inclusive one? Good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of a wider global discussion, isn't it? Um, I think if I think here in the UK, I think the important things to think about, I think school, education, families, you know, what kind of sports are being exposed um, from a young age at school? I mean, I, th I look back, you know, I went, I went to an all girls school, so we were actually only exposed to probably two sports that you kind of had to play. But in my sort of summer breaks, I was playing every sport with my cousins. I was playing tennis, I was playing basketball, I was playing football. Uh, but we were also a family that watched a lot of sports. So it was sort of ingrained in me, I would have to say, from, from early on. Um, but then equally, I think about the current sort of climate. I mean, we can't have a conversation without mentioning COVID. But I think it's been interesting to see that there are more people out and about and active. Um, mm -hmm will that enthusiasm maintain when we get back to whatever that normal is going to be i think there are a lot more devices now as well so are kids are their kids still playing outdoors um i think there's that factor um but then i think like i said you know i think brands have a really important role as well around that purpose that storytelling um if i think of brands that are around you know global bands around sport you know if you're aligning with football then your content should have male and female players. You know, I always try my conversation to bring in the women's team or, you know, in my discussions mention them because they are also ambassadors of, of the club, you know, and, and I think that's key. I think that platform, you know, if we think of campaigns like This Girl Can, you know, that impact, I mean, there's a lot of obviously research behind it and tech and, but an incredible campaign that launched and impacted from a very young age and an older age of women, you know, so I think, I think when you get that right, it, it does influence, it does impact. So I think, yeah, I would say the sports in the schools, I would say the families. So that's from that young age education. And I would say the influence and education of these platforms that we're all across and interacting with as well. I think that's, you know, how do we shift that? 
I do see, I mean, I, I'm a school governor myself and, and, uh, and I always like the opportunity to, to, go to, the, to go to the careers evenings and talk to people about sport as uh, you don't just need to be a player to get involved in sport. Exactly. Yeah. There are so many different types of roles within sport, you know, as an administrator like myself or in media marketing, brands, uh, it's, it's, a whole in, it's a whole industry with, with, you know, you need people who understand finance in sports, you need yeah. people who understand business strategy, you need coaches, I mean, the, don't, you know, women coaches, there are so few around, you need medics, you need everything. So if, if for people that have perhaps gone through their school life thinking that sport is just what they do in the in the spare time that it's a great it's great to be able to say to them you don't just it's not just the players that go to sport um, yeah so, it's exactly yeah. that because after school you know can you still you know can you still play these sports is it so easy to are they accessible are they affordable you know that I think that's important like you said it's education I think if if everyone's yes. aware from a young age there's this whole ecosystem over and above playing I think that's really exciting so how you know how do you think football's doing in terms of its um, increasing the imagery around women and sport do you think it's do you think it's starting to get there I think so I think definitely with the, the last world the last two kind of world cups um, you know I have to be very honest to say I wasn't watching women's football very young but again you know it's it, it wasn't as popular there weren't as many female players and if they were playing it wasn't their profession it was they had a day job yeah. um so i think again i think there are more women coming through that are playing i think they've got a much more powerful platform now finally we've got the leagues we've got more brands coming on board um so again i think that's all slowly coming together um and i think it's also a generational shift i see sort of younger members of the family and i see the girls are playing just as much as the boys so i think it's gonna be really interesting to see over the personally i think in the next 10 years how that journey is going to involve with football and sports. So let's talk a little bit about leadership now. So um, what would you say are your key leadership principles and what do you think are the most important skills for being a successful leader? I think, okay, so I think you have to be, you have to be passionate in what you do. Um, I think especially as a leader, if you're not passionate, I mean, that's contagious and that inspires those that are that you're responsible for and I would say I would say listening is is important um, I think my takeaway my experience is you know yes you have to empower you have to inform and help grow and but you have to also you know listen to those in your team I was you know in media when we had that kind of iPhone post iPhone era where suddenly you know the media offering was completely changing all these new social platforms were coming through I mean I never understood and I still don't understand Snapchat but the younger members, because it didn't resonate obviously at the time, but the younger members of my team were the right audience. Um, so they were engaging with it. So like for me, it sort of was, I took away from that, that whole, right, everyone needs to talk. They are the right audience. In our work, we need to know what impacts and what influences. So the way for us to be able to do that is take advantage of what we've got internally within our team. But then equally as well, for those junior members, I always felt that, I'd always have them part of the sort of general meetings and stuff that we would have. They would all come in because it's important for every level to know the impact overall into the, the business um, mm -hmm. so that they also feel excited to see and, and also have that drive to want to progress in their career, be it the company or somewhere else. And, you know, hopefully empower future leaders. Definitely, definitely. So, um, yeah, leadership is quite is quite challenging as well. Don't you find that um, individuals respond differently to different types of leaders as well? So, you know, yeah. how do you do that with your team? You know, how can you be this 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 type of leader to one and that to another? What 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 approach do you take? I think um, it's hard because I've had a lot of various you know leaders, and you learn you take a lot of learnings. So, you know, you take some of the ways that they lead that might not work. How, okay, how would I do it differently? Um, and I think, look, you know, no one really likes to be micromanaged. I think those leaders are maybe the ones that maybe are being micromanaged above mm -hmm. them, or is it an insecurity? Who knows? There's a reason why people sort of lead the way they lead. I think for me, it was always important to, okay, there are certain ways of doing things, but equally, what what's your contribution like what what do you think we should be doing here because like i said 
you know, sometimes, especially at big corporations, after you know, in 10 years somewhere, you just do things the way you do it. Because you know, oh, this is how we do it, and this is it works. But actually, does it work? Mm. You know, it doesn't always work. You know, so we're lucky in our sectors that we can be agile. We can try different things and take the pros and the cons and and keep growing. And I guess a good question to be thinking about right now, leadership in lockdown and, and leadership on the way out of lockdown. How are you, how are you yeah. managing and leading your team as you start to think about opening, opening the world again? Yeah, it's, in, it's, it's been really interesting. I think for me, um, it's been interesting to see everyone's reactions the first few weeks. So it was mayhem anyway for everyone, but from a professional level, um, a lot of the younger team members were actually they were struggling to get their head around working from home. Um, and I've realized that actually, wait a minute, they're in a very different stage of their career. You know, they're just starting. You know, this is a period where you're out all the time after work and you're out with your new colleagues, with new friends, you know, you're learning. Whereas for me, it wasn't that hard of a struggle because I think that sort of in, you know, that transition between these roles where I, I was consulting for a bit, I was working from home. So I kind of got a bit used to it. Again, it wasn't quite the same because you're still going out, having your meetings, having your coffees, you're not stuck at home. But uh, that mindset for me, I, I didn't struggle too much with it. So it was important to sort of pause and think, okay, hold on a minute. They're not in that same space. First of all, literally a lot of them had to move back home. Um, but then equally professionally, this is a very surreal moment for them. So how do you, how, how do you just support uh, and work through that but I think everyone is looking forward uh, if you're looking forwards now so so the world's we're changing we're starting to open up society's starting to open up so how are you thinking about leading now I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the company first of all actually the company being great actually in um, communicating that you know it's it's working everyone's happy that's the main thing keep safe and you know we'll hopefully we'll be back when we need to be back but I think it's going to be very interesting to see when we finally get that sort of amber light because I don't think it'll be green straight away um you know how is everyone actually going to respond because I think there's a lot who are really keen to get back into the office and that culture is missing but then equally I think there's going to be a lot who might be a bit nervous you know we all we all commute into work you know so there's a lot of factors that, that come into play so I think what's going to be interesting is is those just those key stepping stones and how we address them and how we deal with it yeah absolutely and uh yeah i think we're, we're all we're all stepping into new worlds here and yeah but it's been great for certain things and uh challenging in other respects but yeah. we know uh, there's absolutely no doubt we'll come out of this different people thinking differently yeah, yeah and i think perspectives, uh new perspectives and uh, lots of innovation new ways of working so, um, so. so let's just hope for for uh, you know from a perspective of individual development that, that that's that's still working because i think it, i think it is challenging for those individuals coming into the workplace how do they establish themselves how do we run internships when yeah. nobody's coming to the office how do we give young people an opportunity to come in it's all right if you're in the team but how do we yeah. recruit effectively yeah. So, yeah. so there are lots of challenges but i guess we'll get over them as we will we'll solve those challenges as we, we will. Yeah. people are extremely resilient and resourceful so